Hello everyone. In this session, I will go over what's required to be a CPA if you are an international candidate. Now, I do have a separate recording if you are a U.S. candidate applying for the CPA exam. Let's start by defining what is a U.S. certified public accountant or for short U.S. CPA or simply put a CPA. A CPA is a professional credential issued by one of the 55 states or territories. Now, I always mention states, but also certain territories like Guam can issue those licenses. It authorizes the holder to practice as a CPA in the jurisdiction where the license is issued. Now, the CPA is a license issued by a state or a jurisdiction. It's not an exam you take and you pass. It's not only that, it's part of it is an exam, but this is the big misconception. Many things that the CPA is just an exam. So I'm gonna dive today into what is the CPA is all about, how to become a CPA. Let's go ahead and get started. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, farhatlectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's gonna help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. The purpose of the CPA licensing process is to protect the public interest by ensuring that only individuals who need strict educational examination, which is this is what we are going to be discussing, the exam, but as well as educational, as well as certain experience requirement. So before you can call yourself a CPA, you have to meet those three requirements, which I will cover in this session. Education, examination, and experience. They call them the three E's. I will start with the education requirement. Listen to me carefully. To sit for the CPA exam, the minimum requirement in most states is a bachelor's degree in accounting. Now, how about if you have a bachelor's degree in another field like marketing or finance? Can you sit for the exam? Well, as long as you have a bachelor's degree in anything plus certain amount of accounting courses, each state is different. To sit for the exam, a minimum a bachelor's degree in accounting because the bachelor's degree in accounting will meet both the bachelor's degree requirement and the accounting courses. If you have another degree, you need those accounting courses. Now, to be licensed, you have to have 150 credit practically in all jurisdictions. But to sit for the exam, some states, they would allow you to sit with the 120 credits, which is a bachelor's degree in accounting or a bachelor's degree in another field, plus you take the accounting courses separately. So that's the minimum to sit for the exam. I will repeat this many, many times throughout this recording. The specific requirements vary by state, so you will need to verify your state board of accountancy to determine how can you sit, when can you sit for the exam, and how many credits do you need. Now, if you are an international candidate, you will need to have your education and degree evaluated. And we will discuss the process a little bit more in details throughout this recording. But the minimum is what I just told you. So if you are still a college student, an undergraduate, you cannot apply. You can apply, you can get your college education evaluated, but they're gonna tell you you have to get you have to have your accounting degree first. So we're done with the minimum requirement. Let's discuss the next important topic, and that's selecting a jurisdiction. Remember what I started with? I said the CPA is a license offered by one of 55 jurisdictions or states. So the first thing is you have to select which state do you qualify under. Now, not all states participate in international testing, so it's important to select one that does. So some jurisdictions do not participate in international administration testing. That's it, period. You should not apply to those states. Now, could those states change, for example, Alabama, Idaho, North Carolina, Virgin Islands? Yes, they could. They can change tomorrow. 
they can change and they accept this. But I'm just giving you as an example, you always want to check the jurisdiction. I keep emphasizing this. So you can find a full list of participating jurisdiction on NASBA website. I will be repeating this, this website various times, nasba.org. And remember, there are 55 jurisdictions, and those jurisdictions are constantly changing the rules. So you want to make sure you are up to date. So each jurisdiction has its own specific rules and requirement for taking the exam, for the educational requirement, for the work requirement. Now I can tell you one common hurdle for international CPA exam candidate often face is the social security. To qualify to sit for the exam in some jurisdiction, you need to have a valid social security. In some jurisdiction, they allow you to sit for the exam, although you may not have a social security, but you could run into a problem when you try to obtain your license. So you have to be careful. You have to research the that state, that jurisdiction about their policy when it comes to social security requirement. Now, all application in all states, they will ask you for the social security number. But some might waive this, give you a waiver, or accept an alternative explanation. For example, if you apply in Alaska, candidate can submit an affidavit in place of a social security number. In Colorado, candidates can write a letter to the state explaining why they do not have a social security number. What I mean by state is the state board of accountancy. Just giving you two examples, there might be other states, and those states might change their policy, always check with the state. Now let's go back to the educational requirement. Now for international candidates, at NASBA, there is a division called the International Evaluation Services, NIES, and that's a helpful tool that can recommend up to three jurisdictions based on your education. Obviously, they have to evaluate your education, residency, and social security status. So they would review your, your application, they would review your educational requirement, obviously for a fee, of course, and they would recommend up to three jurisdictions. Now, obviously, you have to also check yourself whether indeed those jurisdictions are best for you and select one that's the most optimal. So the NIES is helpful for refining your search because it's going to help you choose the jurisdiction that at least meet your educational requirements. So at least sit for the exam and let's worry about the licenses licensure later. So once you have selected the jurisdiction and met the educational requirement, what is the next step? Well, the next step is to contact that board of accountancy. I will make sure I do that. Although NAS NASBA told me I qualify, read their requirements and make sure it makes sense. Obviously, ask them for an application or if NASBA accept the application on their behalf, fill the application, submit the application. Again, you have to do what? Pay a fee with that application. What will the application generally include? Obviously, it's gonna include your education evaluation, plus, of course, your passport and some additional paperwork. Make sure you meet the State Board of Accountancy requirement so you can qualify, so they can give you something called NTS notice to schedule, which we will discuss next. So after you pay your fee, and how much is the fee? It depends. It depends on each state, and this amount varies from year to year. That's why I'm not mentioning any particular fees. But the key is to receive this NTS, congratulations. Once you receive your NTS, something called NTS, notice to schedule. So your application has been processed and approved by the State Board of Accountancy. Now you are ready to do what? To schedule your first exam. Now you are officially starting your CPA exam journey because now you met the requirement. Now the NTS is an important document. It confirms your eligibility to sit for the exam and lists the specific sections that you are approved to take. Obviously, you can take any section. Although you can take any section, you want to strategically take the sections in a specific order. You can view certain videos I have about this topic or reach out. I can give you some advice. So the NTS will provide you the window of time within which you must schedule and complete your exam section. So for example, they might give you six months or nine months or three months to start, to start the schedule. Because the NTS is the document that would allow you to schedule. Now, where do you schedule your exam? You schedule your exam in the Prometric 
testing centers either in the US or around the world. Obviously, if you're outside the US, it's around the world. Now I'm gonna give you a list of all the places around the world where you can schedule that test. Now make sure to review your NTS thoroughly and you understand the time frame for taking your exams. Because if you miss the deadline, guess what? You have to reapply again for another NTS. And guess what? You have to pay additional fees. So make sure you're aware of this. I know this happened with many students in the past. Now, once you want to schedule your exam at the Prometric Center, guess what? You have to pay fees again for the Prometric Center. They are administer administering your exam. And this applies especially for international candidates. These fees are adjusted yearly for inflation. I will not list them. Once you get, you, you might be watching this now and taking the exam in two years from now. So the fees will change. That's why I don't mention anything. Now it's time to schedule and take your exam. You're good to go. Let's go ahead and get started. You want to start to study for the exam. Now we're up to the examination step. And this is where most students, they contact me. I want to take the CPA exam. Uh, could you tell me how to do it? When I tell them it's not that easy, you ha we have to go through all these steps before you get to the examination. Now you're at the examination step. There are three core sections that you have to take. Those are you have to take, you must take. The FAR section, financial accounting and reporting, the auditing and attestation, the AUD section, and the regulation section, reg. Regulation is basically US taxation and business law. In addition, in addition to those three required core sections you have to take one more there are four total three core and one discipline you have to choose one of the following three disciplines those are the disciplines you have to take only one either information systems and control isc tax tax compliance and planning tcp or the business analysis and reporting bar which one you should take well, once you get to that stage, you can reach out to me. I can give you some advice. It depends on many factors. You don't have to make that decision now. Now, just qualify for the exam. You can get your NTS, start with your core. I always recommend starting with FAR, F-A-R. So you set for the exam, you passed all four exams. Congratulations. Are you done yet? Are you a CPA? Absolutely not. Now we get to the last step and that's the licensing requirement. Now, in some states, also, they require an ethics test. It's really minor, but in some states, they do. So after passing all four sections, which is you worked hard for it, you're not a CPA yet. Now you have to meet working requirement that is imposed by your state. Now, the working environment will vary from state to state or from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. That's why at the beginning, it's better to research everything before you jump in. Now, you could always switch your jurisdiction. You can move from Pennsylvania to Michigan, from Michigan to Guam, from Guam to Alaska, so on and so forth. Now, in many states, your work experience must be directly supervised by an active CPA holding a license from that particular jurisdiction. Well, guess what? If you're an international candidate, you're going to find hard time working under that active CPA. So that's why you have to kind of think ahead of time. And why the supervision requirement? The state wants to make sure that the, can the candidate are gaining relevant high quality experience under a guidance of a qualified professional because they trust that CPA, they want that CPA to sign your paper. Now, many CPAs require at least one year of public accounting work to qualify for a CPA license. Again, each state is different. Some states are less, are lenient. They're not as, uh, as harsh or as strict. So in some state, they might accept other type of work experience, uh, teaching, self-employment, part-time, some private accounting. Again, each state is different. Plan your CPA journey carefully. Also in some state, they require specifically a certain amount of auditing work experience. I would say most do, but again, some don't, you, you got to be careful. So the specific conditions regarding how that experience must be gained and verified will vary from state to state, just like the educational requirement, just like the social security requirement. Now, some states may allow greater flexibility by permitting your work experience to be verified by an active CPA in any jurisdiction. So any CPA can verify your work experience, not necessarily a CPA in that state. 
So it could be a CPA in Dubai or a CPA in India, and they can sign your paperwork and you're good to go. They don't have to be, you know, they could be licensed in Pennsylvania, you're applying to Guam, it does not really matter. So it's important to check with the State Board of Accountancy and the juris in the jurisdiction where you intend to apply for the license to understand the specific requirement for verifying your work experience. In my opinion, that's the most challenging step. I can definitely help you with passing the exam, the examination. The, the relevant work experience you have to figure out before you start this journey. There is some silver lining for international candidates. So if you don't have a CPA to verify your work experience, NASBA offer an experience verification service. As far as I know, check with NASBA in some states for international candidates. So what they would do, they would help you meet the experience requirement for licensing. They will verify themselves and some states would agree, would accept that. Again, check with NASBA. This is not something I do. It's NASBA, if they're still offering it, that's really great. So notice what we did, we went through the requirement. It was not as easy. First, minimum educational requirement. Don't even think about applying to the exam if you don't have a bachelor's degree in accounting. If you have a bachelor's degree in some other field but you have certain accounting courses, at least apply, get your education credits evaluated. Once that happens, you want to select a jurisdiction. NASBA would help you select, you know, give you some options. Select a jurisdiction that best fits your qualification. Next, once you qualify, sit for the exam, take the exam. This is the step where I can help you. I can help you study and pass the exam. Great. Are you done yet? Not yet? Then the licensing requirement. As I mentioned, some states, they require an ethics test. It's not an obstacle. It's not a big deal at all. Farhat Lectures is always here to help. If you're studying for the exam, please, we can help you. We can help you. Also reach out if you have any questions about this process, but the best way to start is nasba.org. Go ahead, start an application as an international candidate. Follow the instruction, they're very helpful. Stay motivated, 100% the CPA is worth it. Invest in yourself, stay safe.